Welcome to Coleman Report Live. I'm Bob Coleman, and we're talking Main Street with Lance and Katie, who are helping in the small business lenders who help Main Street grow. Lance, good to see you. Good to be here. Woo Katie. Pig Surrey again, Bob. We're in the Elite Eight, along with USC and UCLA. Well, well I know. Uh, fight on. I don't know. <laughs> As I say, maybe make the final four, and then I'll be a big fan. Hey, we got a lot of news going on. We appreciate your support. Please ask questions. Uh, we are rebranding our PPP answer desk to PPP slash SBA one, so you can go there, ask any questions you want. And Lance and Katie have been very diligent in answering those, and um, you also have the ability to go in there and answer questions and post and whatever. So it's it's turned out to be a good service. So thank you for your support on that. Let's go to the poll questions. According to the ABA, how many uh, American Bankers Association, just want to make sure that's not the American Bar Association, American Bankers, <laughs> how many jobs have been supported by PPP? And if you look at that low number and that high number, Lance, uh, we're talking a lot of jobs, no matter what the right answer is. We'll give it to yeah, you. Yeah, and I'm not sure what the answer is, Bob, but I'm going to lean toward $94 billion. Katie, is he right or wrong? Let's see. Oh, our audience is right. Yeah, the, the, it's uh, 78 million uh, that they're reporting between both first and second draw combined. That's incredible. That is, and I think that's, uh, it, I'm a big history buff, as everyone knows, and it'll be interesting when we write the history of what happened. Was it good or bad? Is it everything you think could have been better? But... I'd love to see someone contrast and compare what happened today with what happened during the Great Recession. We bailed out Wall Street here. We're bailing out Main Street. And when it, when all the dust settles, which strategy was best? I have my... Uh, well, the numbers are so... In, Go ahead, Lance. The numbers are so impressive, Bob. Uh, wonder what percentage of all the jobs that are out there uh, were supported by PPP because the American population, what is it, 350 million? Yeah. And how many pe how many of those people are employable Americans? Uh, it's got to be pretty close to 30 or 40 percent of everybody who works was supported by PPP or mm -hmm. pretty close. Well, I remember during the G uh, General Motors bailout, which was ended up costing us $50 billion dollars, and we were all touting that, hey, to save 60,000 jobs in the supply line. Well, I'm not minimizing those 60,000 jobs, but you compare 60,000 with uh, 78 million. That's uh, fairly impressive. Yeah, so uh, we'll have to crunch numbers and whatever, but I, I think it's also important to take a step back and see where we are. We can complain about fraud. We can complain about everything. But, Lance, if we didn't have PPP, we would be in a world of hurt today. We would have unemployment rates that we have uh, never big, experienced big in our lives. Yeah. Very good. Number two, what percentage of small business owners are comfortable with their cash flow today? Bob, I was a small business owner for seven years. I don't know that I was ever full. I was going to say that, that's a trick question, but uh, maybe uh, how many of them have their cash uh, needs met. And the number is pretty high, higher than I thought. Lance, what do you think it is? Uh, I'm going to guess 50 to 74. Yeah, 62 percent is the right answer, right, Katie? Yeah, this is uh, coming out of a report that MetLife and U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, put out about a week ago, uh, and they're saying that about 62 percent are feeling at least uh, somewhat comfortable with their cash flow where they are right now. Of course. Uh, they would always appreciate more, but they're feeling more comfortable, definitely, which is nice to see, especially as the pandemic uh, starts to wind down and things like that. You're still seeing people that are comfortable, and that's good. Yeah, and 62 thirds, that's, uh, of course, that means one third aren't. So um, that's why we have second draw, whatever. Finally, we'll talk about the PPP extension in a second. But how long, and now this, uh, how long do you think it will take to get to pre-pandemic economic conditions? <laughs> I am so there's no right answer. people think, Bob. Yeah. 
I would have, I, yeah, I probably would have gone over one year myself, but uh, yeah, six um, months. Go ahead. I'm with you, Bob. I, I would have probably went with something over a year. Uh, definitely would not have gone with never, but. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I know 20% I think, never, but it'll, it, it's going to come back. It always does. Yeah, I, I think the economy will be back to where it was and even hit greater heights. But I do think that there's some pains that we'll have to go through once the oh, pandemic. Absolutely. Goes. Change is a con one constant. There will be winners and losers. There will be cultural shifts in terms of how we operate as a society. All that is in place, but um, we will we will adapt. We were very we're very adaptable. We'll adapt to the new normal. Um, and uh, that's uh, I was reading an article the other day about Amazon. Amazon is just buying up all of the real estate in Southern California and doing these great logistics. And they're committed to two-hour delivery. I mean, that's that's huge. All right, let's go to the news, the big news. Katie, whew, we got it signed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, June, so, yeah to, uh, June 30th. that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, this hasn't been signed yet as of this oh, morning, at least when I checked. Okay. Right. Uh, but I don't think there's any question that it's going to be uh, signed before the end of the uh, the deadline, I guess, the end of the month. Uh, there's no really uh, problem with this. The, this is that bill. It extends it through May for, for the borrower to apply. And then uh, the end of May through June 30th, uh, the SBA can process any applications that are still in the system uh, and finish up the program. And they are saying that this sounds like what they want to do is sunset the program at that point. Yeah, what do we mean, what do we mean the bill excludes budgetary effects? What do we mean by that? Uh, so it didn't include any additional funding for PPP, and there also wasn't uh, any kind of analysis on how it will affect uh, the, the federal budget. Uh, and they did that primarily so that they don't have to uh, go through a couple more uh, committees and things like that so that they could get this passed before the end of the program. Because uh, otherwise, you might have seen a gap between uh, when this uh, got passed and when, um, or when the program ended and when it really got uh, back into place. So they did want to speed it up a little bit, and so they didn't include uh, either of those things. Lance Cristobal, do we have enough money for it to last through May 31st? We've heard six uh, weeks. Go I ahead. actually think it will, Bob, because I think any – you know, first point is this round of PPP has fewer large, really large PPP mm -hmm. loans in it. Uh, I think most people who wanted a second draw, with the exception of those small business owners who maybe were hesitant, have gotten a second draw loan. So I actually think the money will probably last through this entire period. Lance, you're the one who first warned me of supply chain impact. Well, that was over a year ago, talking about your brother in his furniture store not being able to get inventory. Katie, we had a hearing on Friday about that. Yeah, so the House is actually uh, sending a letter to the U.S. Postal, uh, uh, Post Office uh, General. And the reason being, uh, I think we can advance to the next slide. Come on, Michael. Uh, Come on. There we yeah, go, Mike. There we go. Very good. Yeah. Uh, so the reason being is the 10 year plan that he recently uh, released does not really address the effect it would have on small businesses. And looking at how many small businesses use USPS opposed to things like FedEx or uh, UPS, it is a significant portion. They're saying about 70 percent of micro businesses, which is uh, defined as businesses with 10 or less employees, use USPS because it's cheaper for them and it's easier for them to use. Uh, and by not addressing that and creating actually a slower process for USPS uh, would deeply impact some of these supply chains for small businesses, uh, not only for receiving things, but also shipping it out. Lance, how's your brother doing with his supply chain? Uh, it started getting better, but it's still slow. And you know, the thing that's impacting small businesses now that we've not really talked about is the price of fuel. Uh, 
you know, my brother shared with me the other day, he gets a truckload of furniture in now, and there's a fuel surcharge on every shipment that he's getting as a result of higher gasoline prices. And that uh, causes him to either have to increase his prices slightly or uh, cut into his uh, gross margin. And of course, most small businesses will increase their prices slightly, but uh, the supply chain is starting to get better still not where it was, but uh, they're finding that the cost to get product to the business has increased. Especially if you're in uh, shipping through the Suez Canal, but hey, I guess they got it open. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, Katie, uh, a lot of interesting stats to highlight them for us. One more yeah, slide, so Yeah, this. Tell us on vacation, by the way, so. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the uh, quarterly report that came out from MetLife and U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it is a little early to finish up the quarter, but uh, this their preliminary data. Uh, I thought it was interesting because they're saying uh, half of small business owners are feeling more optimistic uh, about the future of their business, and a little more than half now, it's about 60% are, are feeling better about the business climate across the entire country. Uh, this is con a deep contrast to previous quarters where they were feeling uh, not so optimistic. And so it's definitely showing that uh, as we're coming out of the pandemic, people are feeling a lot better about that. Uh, like we were already talking about um, how long it'll take to get back to pre-pandemic conditions. They're reporting that small business owners are thinking it's um, going to take about six months to a year, uh, and that's 59%. Uh, it was uh, varied, but it seemed like that was definitely the higher portion. I think they have a graph. I didn't include it here, but it is included in the Main Street Monday article or on our website if you want to see it. 45% uh, of small business owners say they can operate indefinitely without shutting down in the current environment. That's raised by about 10% uh, from their last reading. So that is very significant. Uh, and hopefully that will keep going up uh, as we start to pull out of the pandemic. 62% of small business owners say they are comfortable with their cash flow. We already discussed that a little bit. Uh, again, that's going up slightly. Uh, but I think that's just reflecting uh, as the year goes on. 47% uh, anticipate the revenue increasing this year, uh, and just 14% expect it to decrease. And over half of small business owners are now saying that they are likely to require employee COVID-19 vaccinations uh, yeah. before they fully open up again. And uh, most of them, I kind of looked at the reasons for that. Uh, most business owners are going to say they're concerned about their employees' uh, health. But some of them are concerned about things like uh, lawsuits and things like that yeah. as well, uh, liability and those sure. issues. Yeah, very, very good. Um, we look, we, Katie takes a look at a lot of these reports. Um, I'm a fan of the Chamber of Commerce report. It, it, it's one of the better ones that are, that is done. The Fed does some very good work. Also NFIB. So we, we, when those these come out, we highlight those very much. Um, Andrea says, okay. Put Lance on the hot seat. Andrew asks, we have a Schedule C PPP app in which the profession list does not match the NAICS code. The applicant said he did that profession seismic research about six years ago. Has never been and has become an insurance agent since then. Well, this uh, that's kind of a tough one, Bob, because I, my, I suspect that the SBA's uh, – analytics will pick up on the fact that their tax return has a different NAICS code than their application. Now, does it matter? Probably right. not, because I don't think either NAICS code is going to result right. in, uh, you know, the amount being different. Uh, I would lean toward using the NAICS code that the tax return has simply because that's the NAICS code of record. Uh, and then they need to correct that uh, NAICS code on their new tax return going forward. But uh, it's... Is this uh, worth amending? We can go back and amend tax returns. Can we amend? Uh, I think you could, but I'm not sure there's... If it would do any good. 
You know, I, I, I believe that using the NAICS code that's on the tax return is probably the correct path here, even though it may not reflect what they're doing at this time. But in the scheme of things, it's not going to, it's not a NAICS code 72, so it's not really right. going to impact the application. But how do we, how do we transmit that information to SBA? Uh, do we do anything separately? It's, you know, in, in this we particular... Even, are we, are we them to put it on a hold code and then we deal with it? Yeah, in this particular case, you might submit it and wait for the hold code and correct it. Now that we have an extension pass, there'll be time to fix that. Uh, you may also reach out, you know, you guys have heard me say this a number of times to your district office and share with them what the problem is and see what their take is on submission mm -hmm. of the PPP application. Uh, they may be in the same boat I am saying the, the NAICS code on the tax return is probably the one that should be reflected. Uh, but uh, it's... Like I said, said I, I would reach out to somebody I know. That, Bob, if I had this one, I would call my friend Herb Lawrence at the Arkansas District Office and say, Herb, here's a problem I have. What do you think I should do? Do me a favor. Don't give his phone number out, please. <laughs> Everybody will call Herb. You, call Lance, who will talk, talk to Herb. How's that sound? <laughs> um, very good. Um can a person, uh, someone who's still concerned about all of the um, defaulted rules, the seven-year rules, student loans, et cetera, can they still qualify if they defaulted on a loan, period? I think it depends on the type of loan. We had some revisions where student loan defaults were not uh, prohibited from getting a PPP loan, but an SBA or USDA loan default will still keep you from getting a PPP loan. FHA, a house yeah, various other, the only type of federal loan that was, I guess, exempted from keeping Still somebody alive. from being eligible is student debt. Very good, very good. Uh, Kristen just sent us a question. Can you detail the SBA rules for idle loans, not advances, idle uh, that we can refinance with the first, that we, uh, idle loans being eligible refinanced? with first draw of 2021 PPP loans. I picture that, but. And, and I can't, Bob. That's, I'm just going to give yeah. you an honest answer. I can't even read the question, so <laughs> good luck with the answer. Yeah. Um, basically, overall, can we refinance idle with PPP? Uh, I don't know why someone would, Bob. Okay. Uh, the idle loan is used for working capital. It has more flexibility. It's got a longer term. Now, I do understand that the PPP loan would be uh, forgivable, but uh, again, I, I I just don't have a good answer. Yeah, well, PPP one of the proceeds isn't for to refinance, correct, Lance? Shouldn't be. No. Yeah. So so we we have that issue. Um, uh, can we refinance a PPP loan with a 7A loan? Again, why would you want to? But. Well, you know, the problem, Bob, is it's, uh, it, it's going to fall back to regular underwriting standards. Uh, unless they change things, it's a SBA 7A loan. And to refinance it with a new SBA loan, it's going to have to have uh, the potential for cash, it's going to have to have be on unreasonable terms or there'll have to be some additional, uh, for instance, maybe an expansion included. Uh, I would suspect that you might be able to, Bob, but you'd have to meet those rules for refinancing debt that are in the SOP 5106, uh, specifically the rules on refinancing existing SBA loans. Lance, where you're doing a webinar next week on business acquisition. Uh, real quick, what are the BizAC rules with PPP? Can we acquire those? Should we pay those off? What uh, I know Typically you're going to be talking about. When you have a this. company acquiring a company business that has an existing PPP loan, uh, you have to escrow an amount equal to the PPP loan until the forgiveness process is taken care of. 
Okay, very good. And as soon as SBA announces the 504 refinance um, things, we will reactivate that webinar. We have a number of people signed up who are being patient. Thank you for your patience, and we will do that. Katie, when are they going to release the rules? <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, there hasn't been too much talk on the 504 front right now. Uh, I know that I know everybody's paid well, impatiently waiting for those refi uh, rules, but we haven't heard anything yet uh, on when they're when they're uh, releasing that or anything like that. So as soon as those are released, we'll be working on getting that webinar up and running. Lance and Katie, as always, love your information. Katie, good job. Lance, good to see you. I appreciate all your insight. All right, go ahead. What is it? What what's what, what's the suey? What do they do? Oh, it's woo. Pig, suey, razorbacks. And with that, this concludes today's <laughs> show. Have a good day. Thank you very Have much. A good day.